So in our last couple videos, we've talked about cells, and in our last video, we talked about uh, the membranes that make up cells. And in this video, we're going to look specifically at transport across the membrane uh, within cells. And this is IV section 1.4, and this is for the 2016 exam material. Before we get into the, to, to some of the more specifics of transport across the membrane, uh, we need to talk about and, and have an understanding of what diffusion and osmosis is and how they are similar and how they are different. Diffusion is a passive, meaning it does not require any, any energy. Um, it's a passive movement of particles from a region of high concentration to low concentration. So here in this image we have an area of high concentration where there's lots of particles. We have an area of low concentration, and over time, these particles, um, either because they're small enough or the polarity matches, they're able to move from this area of high concentration outside of the cell to within the cell. And this will occur, and it will take place until there's an equal balance, until equilibrium has been met. Um, and so this process is called diffusion. Um, it does not necessarily have to happen just within a cell. If you think about uh, lighting a match in the corner of a room, or if you light a candle, or spray perfume, or cologne, or something like that. Initially, at the opposite end of the room, somebody's not going to be able to smell whatever it is that's being released. Over time, those particles that, that make up the smell will diffuse throughout the room, and so after a couple of minutes, uh, you should be able to smell those. That is diffusion. Osmosis is very, very similar to diffusion. It is also passive, so there's no energy. Uh, it's the movement of water molecules, specifically water molecules, across a partially permeable membrane from a le region of lower solute, like a solid, um, or a region of higher water concentration to a region of higher s solute concentration. So it's still movement of water from high to low concentration. Um, so if there's a high concentration of water, there's going to be a low solute concentration. So um, you can think of the solute as salt or sugar. So in this image, the little uh, blue circles are representing water, the red circles are representing sugar. In this area there's lots of sugar, not as much water. In this area there's lots of water and less sugar. So through osmosis, we have a semi-permeable membrane here, through osmosis what occurs is the water molecules move to the area of higher um, solute concentration in order to create a balance or an equilibrium. Um, you can actually see in this situation the water levels would change. So here's a nice diagram to help uh, kind of outline all of this. Diffusion, movement of, of solutes, um, uh, membrane is not necessary. Both are passive transport, both move against, uh, I'm sorry, move uh, down the concentration gradient moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Osmosis is specifically for water molecules and a semi membrane is required. So both of those um, are examples of simple diffusion. Again, movement of molecules across semi permeable membrane until homeostasis is met, is met. Doesn't require any energy. Another example of this would be if you were to add dye or food coloring to a liquid sample. Eventually it would spread out so that the whole liquid has that color. A second form of simple um, diffusion, passive transport, is facilitated diffusion. And this is the movement of molecules still from areas of high concentration to low concentration, so it's passive transport, no energy is required. But because of the polarity of the molecules, or if they are ions positively negatively charged, uh, they can't just move across the phospholipid bilayer on their own. They need the help of something. They need a facilitator. And that facilitator is a protein. And what, what that does is it um, moves, helps to move the protein, excuse me, the, the, the molecule across the membrane. Um, and there's two different ways that this can happen. One can be through a channel protein, like our top image here. You can think of this as just like a tunnel. The molecules move from high concentration to low concentration through this channel. The second is um, something that we call a protein carrier. And again, still moving from high concentration to low concentration, but in this case, the, the, the protein is changing its shape. And so in this case, the molecule binds the protein, the protein changes its shape, and then releases it, in this case, inside of the cell. Again, both of these don't require energy. Active transport is very different than, pro, uh, than passive transport. 
And in active transport, um, solutes move against their concentration gradient through some sort of protein. And this does require energy. This is a movement of, of molecules from areas of low concentration to high concentration. So as I said in a previous video, it's like pumping water uphill. It requires energy or work to do that. Um, one of the reasons why cells will actually spend energy doing this is it allows a uh, cell to maintain internal concentrations of solutes that, that differ from the external environment. For, so in some situations, a cell would actually need to, to have a lower concentration um, and move things outside of the cell, active transport allows that to happen. And an example that we're going to take a closer look at is the sodium-potassium pump, um, in which sodium is pumped out of the cell and potassium into the cell, both against their concentration gradients. We have an image here of the process, and in your textbook you, that you will find some great images that, that detail the steps and break it down, um, and we'll go through these st uh, different steps in a little bit more detail in a moment. Another portion of transporting is not just moving things in or without, outside of the, of the cell, but also transporting larger bundles of molecules um, or a collection of items. And this is completed by something called a vesicle. A vesicle you could think of as like a luggage bag or a storage bag or something like that. And it's what the cell uses to either get rid of waste or remove something from a cell or to bring something in. Uh, there's two different types of this, endo and exocytosis, and we'll talk about exocytosis first. Exocytosis is the exit of something from the cell. And this occurs by the fusion of a vesicle with the plasma membrane. So the vesicle has maybe waste. We'll use that as an example. It has waste within it. The membrane of the vesicle is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, just like the plasma membrane of the cell. And so as that vesicle moves towards the, the membrane of the cell, it then fuses with the membrane of the cell and because they're the same materials, and then the particles are released outside of the cell. This is exocytosis. Um, so usually what happens is a vesicle from the Golgi apparatus moves to the plasma membrane. The membrane of the vesicle and the plasma membrane fuse. The vesicle contents are released out of the cell. Endocytosis is the complete opposite of that, but it's essentially the same process. Endo means in, so it's just the reverse of exocytosis. In this case, a vesicle outside of the cell comes along and fuses with the plasma membrane, and as it does so, because they're both made out of a phospholipid bilayer, the contents of that vesicle are released into the cell. Um, this, a small portion of the plasma membrane pinches inward, and then those contents are released. And so here's an image of exocytosis. Here's our Golgi apparatus um, in both of these situations. It is the release of something. And so here's a vesicle, here's a vesicle. Um, that vesicle comes along and it fuses with the membrane and it releases that contents outside of the cell. Signals from outside of the cell, and as they're um, recognized maybe by a glycoprotein or something else, uh, the presence of that signal can cause something to be released. So in this, in this case, um, something is being secreted from the cell and that's released from a vesicle, fuses with the plasma membrane, and it releases whatever that, that product is. So let's talk about a form or an example of active transport, uh, specifically the sodium-potassium pump. Let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is active transport in a nerve axon, so it's happening in a nerve cell. And the axons are used to send messages from one part of the body to another. And so in this case, the pumps are using ATP. ATP is, is the energy that, that allows cells and organelles to do work, specifically cells. And it's made by uh, mitochondria through the process of cellular respiration. In this example, three sodium ions, which are sodium ions, the orange ones, enter the pump and attach to binding sites. So they're attaching to this binding site here. ATP transfers one phosphate group to the pump. You can see that step happening here. Causing the shape change and interior to close. So this edge, this side of the pump, after those three sodium ions have bonded, attached, uh, it closes. And the release of a phosphate is what sparks that energy. It drives that energy. And so the interior of the pump then opens 
to the outside of the axon and the sodium is released. This is outside of the cell and that sodium is being released. Two potassium ions, these yellow oval shapes, from outside the cell enter and attach to their binding sites. Potassium um, binding releases the phosphate group that was attached from the ATP, changing the shape of it again. The protein then, uh, the pump then opens to the interior of the cell and it thus brings potassium ions are released inside of the cell and that process starts all over. This is a movement from low concentration to high concentration. The high concentration of sodium ions are outside of the cell. The high concentration of potassium ions are inside the cell, but that's not the way or the direction that they're being pumped. The potassium's coming into the cell, the sodium's going out. So this is an opposite direction of diffusion or, or passive transport. Hypertonic, hypotonic solutions are extremely important. Uh, the osmolarity uh, in medical procedures is extremely important, and we're going to look at some reasons why that is. In a hypertonic solution, there's a higher osmolarity, uh, meaning that water will leave the cell so that the cytoplasm shrinks. Um, and here is an image of a hypertonic. So in a hypertonic, um, water is leaving the cell, so there's a, a higher concentration of water inside the cell. And in the case of uh, blood cells, um, water is going to be released and could cause them to essentially shrink and, and be destroyed. In a hypotonic solution, there's lower osmol uh, osmolarity, and so water insert, uh, enters the, the cytoplasm of the cell, and it can cause it to expand and rupture. And so these cells here could rupture because they're taking in too much water. There'd be a higher concentration of water outside of the cell and lower on the inside. Isotonic is the balance. It's an in-between point, and that is homeostasis or equilibrium, isotonic. Um, human tissue needs to be in an isotonic solution, um, so the same osmolarity as cells, in order to ensure that they don't shrink or rupture. Obviously, that's really important. You don't want your cells inside of your, your organs to, um, to be rupturing. Uh, a normal saline solution, isotonic solution, is about 300 milliosomoles. Uh, within plants, it's slightly different. And hypertonic when water is leaving the plant cells, it can cause the insides, uh, basically everything inside of the cell wall to shrink. And isotonic, the plant is actually flaccid. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not standing upright. You've probably seen this. If on a hot day, uh, the plant looks kind of wilted, you give it some water, a little bit later it looks quite a bit better, that plant is an isotonic. Plants actually prefer to be hypotonic, meaning that their cells are, uh, and specifically the central vacuole is almost bursting with water, it has it very full of water, and that helps it to give it its turgor pressure and, and stand upright. Um, normal saline uh, solution, as we talked about, could be used as an intravenous drip um, to rinse wounds. It's the basis for eye drops, and it's also frozen for the, the packing uh, of organ transplant to make that possible. And so having isotonic solutions um, is very important from a medical standpoint to ensure that um, cells and, and organs are not destroyed. That's it for our discussion of transport. Uh, we'll have one last video for this unit uh, that will come up next.